Unique people leading unique lives shape and inform Iowa City. This community is enhanced by these women and men who live in our midst, working, teaching, creating. Welcome to a series of conversations with people who have stories to tell. Join my guests and me, Ellen Buchanan, in a series of interviews called One of a Kind. Twenty years ago, my guest Marilyn Robinson moved to Iowa City. She is an award-winning novelist, essayist, critic, and teacher in the Iowa Writers Workshop. Her 1980 novel, Housekeeping, won the Penn Hemingway Award for the best first novel and nominated for a Pulitzer. Her second novel, Gilead, written in 2004, won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction the National Critics Circle Award, and the Ambassador Book Award. Her third novel, Home, took the 2009 Orange Prize for fiction. It's given to the woman who has written the best novel in English. I quote one of the judges for the Orange Prize. She is one of the most intellectually ambitious novelists in English. She trusts her readers to be able to think to appreciate language for its own sake, and while she is morally serious, she is never humorless." End quote. In addition to her fiction, she authored Mother Country, Britain, The Welfare State, and Nuclear Pollution, and The Death of Adam, Essays on Modern Thought. Her articles and book reviews have appeared in Harper's, The Paris Review, The New York Times Book Review. As a teacher, in the Iowa Writers' Workshop, students pack her seminars. A longtime member of the Congregational United Church of Christ, she sometimes is asked to preach. Marilyn Robinson is the mother of two sons and a granddaughter. Welcome to One of a Kind. Well, thank you. <laughs> Wonderful to be here. Your story begins in Sandpoint, Idaho in 1943, where you were born and raised, and your father was in the timber business, and you have one brother. How did they influence you in, uh, politically, religiously, and socially? I had a nice, a very interesting childhood that was a, um, much, you know, that reflected the fact that I lived in a very interesting landscape. Um, we were in the mountains, then there were forests all around us, and we lived in that period when children could more or less come and go, you know, as they if we were home for supper, everything was fine, you know. Um, my friends and I spent a lot of time just being on our own in the, you know, in the wilderness almost, you know. I mean, we lived in town, but, but um, the woods were not far from us. And, and um, we visited my grandfather's house, which was on a, what they call a ranch, a very small ranch. Um, and again, you know, there were just woods everywhere, wild strawberries, Lady Slippers, all those sorts of things. It was a, it was a nice childhood. I felt um, free more than anything else. I mean, in the sense that I certainly didn't feel any pressure to, you know, toward religion or away from it, mm -hmm. toward any interest of mine or away from it. Um, I was a very bookish sort of child. My brother was also. And uh, we, it was just a nice life. What did you want to be when you were little? What did you want to be when you grew up, I mean? I think that I probably thought less about that than anybody I've ever known, except maybe my brother. What did he want for you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, um, we both did what we wanted to do. I, I read and, and wrote bad little poems, and, and my brother drew and painted and read. and um, <clears throat> We sort of did it for the pleasure of it without any specific um, idea of being anything, you know. I mean, um, we weren't we weren't really oriented toward our adulthood in the way that a lot of kids are now. I think we just did what we took pleasure from, and 
and you know, I think it, it was true of us, it would be true for a lot of children, that uh, we made considerable demands on ourselves. You know, we did diff difficult things, but not because anyone expected us mm -hmm. to. So your parents were pretty relaxed about child rearing with they you? They were, <laughs> I would say they were, yes. I mean, come home after, you know, become home before dark? Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. They don't, kids don't get that. Uh, admonition now about, you know, they were no. so regulated. Exactly, and, and exactly. There were things, you know, that were absolutely forbidden, like swearing and that sort of, you know, things <laughs> like that, playing with matches, you know, <laughs> the usual things. But um, but I didn't feel as if my parents were trying to direct, direct my life in any, mm -hmm. in any specific way. I think that they, they expected me to go to college when I was done with high school and things like that. I mean, because people in my family did, but, um, but childhood, we sort of lived out for its own sake, and I think that was a good thing. So you didn't become a poet, you became a writer, and your brother, did he become an artist? Yes, he still paints. Um, he, he's an art historian, and he teaches at the University of Virginia. And, um, you know, so we have sort of parallel lives. Both in academics, mm -hmm. and both, yes. Um, you grew up, I read, in the research in a Presbyterian household. Did you have a favorite Bible story growing up? Was there one that just you loved? Probably Ruth. Because? Well, I mean, it's a, I've, I've, sometimes I think that loyalty is the thing that appeals to me more than almost anything, you know. And it is a beautiful story of loyalty between people who love each other, mm -hmm. you know. Um, your Idaho was the setting for your first novel, Housekeeping, and then your second and third was Iowa. Mm -hmm. And how did you get to know the Iowa people and landscape and write two beautiful books about it? Well, when I first came here, I, I had lived in Massachusetts for quite a while, and I just wanted to know where I was. I, you know. Um, in Massachusetts, you can't be there for very long at all without basically knowing the history of the place. And, and in Idaho, the, the history is pretty brief, and also my family had been there for so long, you know, that I sort of took it in, you know. But uh, here, I didn't know anything about it. And, and I, I literally would ask people what the history of the place is, and they would say it didn't have one, which just stunned me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I did a lot of uh, reading about the history of the Middle West and the history of Iowa specifically. Um, reading uh, documents and things that were contemporary with the early settlement of it. And um, with particular interest in the abolitionist movement. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I did that and I also sort of trained my eye to, to uh, understand the aesthetic of a landscape that is not dominated by hills or mountains, <laughs> you know. And um, then <clears throat> I just did those things for my own sake, but then um, at a certain point I realized that a novel was coming into my mind and that it was set in Iowa and that the things that I had learned and observed and so on would, were being precipitated in this, this novel that was emerging in my mind. Would you read, there's a wonderful excerpt in Gilead um, about the prairie, and uh, I, it's just lovely. Oh, thank you. I will. I love the prairie. So often I've seen the dawn come and the light flood over the land and everything turn radiant at once. That word good so profoundly affirmed in my soul that I am amazed I should be allowed to witness such a thing. Mm -hmm. There may have been a more wonderful first moment when all the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. But for all I know to the contrary, they still do sing and shout and they certainly might well. Here on the prairie, there is nothing to distract attention from the evening and morning nothing on the horizon to abbreviate or delay. Mountains would seem an impertinence from that point of view. That's just beautiful. <laughs> well, thank and people you. who have grown up on the prairie, I know that speaks to them. Um, going on in your story, you graduated from high school and then you were off to Pembroke 
Women's College, which was part of the uni Brown University. Mm -hmm. And then you went to the West Coast, to the University of Washington, and you got your uh, PhD there. Mm -hmm. And your dissertation was on Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. Did you, what, what, what Shakespeare plays or uh, writings of, um, I read someplace that it was, you took the tact of what was Shakespeare reading at the time, is that? Was that right? Or did I get that wrong? <laughs> well, in, in you research. got it wrong. Just fine-tune <laughs> okay, it a little fine -tune bit. Okay, fine-tune it for me. <laughs> um, I wrote my dissertation on the first history plays, the, the, the first uh, three history plays with uh, special attention to Second Henry the Sixth, the, um, the second of the trilogy. Um, I, <clears throat> I wanted to understand the historical basis for the Play, and so I read everything that it would be reasonable to assume that Shakespeare had in mind as he wrote it. Things, the, the chronicle histories, um, Mirror from Magistrates, and so on. Um, Fox's Acts and Monuments of the Martyrs. And um, that was basically what I did. And, and frankly, I arrived at the conclusion that <laughs> a lot of people that wrote about those plays or about Shakespeare in general did not read what would have been contemporary, what would have been in circulation when he was writing. Because what he does to a very large extent is adapt and popularize historical writing, you know, <laughs> that uh, uh, he, in a certain sense he takes sides among the, the, the versions of events that are represented in the different historical traditions and he um, makes the history of England available to his audience in a, a very uh, imaginative way, but nevertheless one that stays remarkably close to what is taken to have been the truth of the period. It's a pretty violent play. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very violent <laughs> history. I know. Violent <laughs> times, my yes, goodness. Yes. Um, then, uh, I don't know how long it was till you were at the University of Kent, and you got involved um, uh, in uh, a subject matter that's very close to your heart. Will you talk about um, this nuclear waste and this, the book called Mother Country? Uh, well, when I, I was teaching at the University of Canterbury in Kent in England, and um, I just was reading the newspaper. I mean, when I, I had lived in France a couple of years before that in Tottenham French University, and, and I had gotten in the habit of reading the newspapers, listening to the news and so on, and just to find out the life of another country because we get such bad, meager, ill-informed information here. In any case, while I was um, in England, um, this issue arose of Sellafield. It had had a, um, it has spills all the time, and the spills are not the real problem. The real problem is that it simply disgorges nuclear waste on a routine basis day after day, as it has done since 1957, um, in the course of producing uh, bomb-grade plutonium and uranium, um, and then many other sorts mm -hmm. of isotopes of various things. But um, they break down, they break down nuclear waste with nitric acid, and then put the acid and whatever they can't retrieve from this bath that they make into this into the Irish Sea. Um, they say they say that it fuses to the sea bottom, you know, which is just absurd. You know, I mean, you know what the sea bottom yes. is like. Um, nevertheless, they've gotten away with this for years and years. And and uh, every once in a while, an issue comes up. They f they flood the coast of Ireland with nuclear waste in quantities that can't be ignored. It 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 reaches Scandinavia, of course, and Iceland, and so on. It's a huge problem, um, but. There are cancer clusters that emerge, you know, mm. I mean, or that not, I'm sure <laughs> there are cancer clusters that receive attention. Um, and that was something that was being dealt with while I was there, that it turned out uh, a journalist had found a very, very high rate of childhood leukemia, of death from childhood le leukemia in the villages nearest this plant. So they go through this whole thing. It always ends up with um, British <coughs> Nuclear Fuels, which is a government-owned corporation, paying 10,000 uh, pounds, you know, a fine or something like that. Nothing, nothing, nothing remotely commensurate with what's happening, and nothing is done. It only grows. So 
who was this for? Who was this book written for? Mother Country was this um, for the government, for the general public? Who anybody who would read it? I I um, collected all the information that I could while I was in England, but of course. It's completely generally available information, not only in England, but in the United States, if you go to a good university library. Hmm. Um, but it's, I mean, um, about 70% of my interest in the issue is that it is so blatant, so obvious, so accessible as information, and so unknown. And how this can be, except, of course, that people don't want it to be true, you know? I mean, I, I would speak to Americans about about it while I was there. There would be articles on the front page that said things like, you know, it's, it has, they've begun to think that uh, ingesting plutonium is more harmful to children than had previously been thought. Now, who in the world, who in the world ever thought there was anything <laughs> benign about that, you know? But it, it would be on the front page of the London Times or the Guardian Observer, whatever. And uh, I would say, isn't that amazing what they're doing with plutonium? And other Americans would say, what plutonium? I mean, it's like some kind of deeply acculturated blindness that just refuses, refuses to be aware. You worked on this for how many years, this book? Oh, I don't know. I don't I count years. <laughs> oh, if you okay. think how long it would take to write a book, you'd never write one, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> but I did do an enormous amount of research, not only um, you know, into the workings of the plant and the issues that surround these things, um, the radiological issues, but also the cultural and economic history that would allow such a thing to happen in a country that we, that we think of as being somewhat benevolently inclined toward its own population. Are your students now curious about this time in your life when you were so committed to get the story out and kind of an expose of what they were doing? Not particularly. Not particularly. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. No. People, um, it, it's a strange thing. I mean, I was able to, to write Mother Country in the first place because I'd published housekeeping, you know? I mean, I, when this issue came up and it was so obvious to me what it was, I thought, I don't have any choice. I have to write this because I can, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and then, so it was, in fact, my you know, station in life because of housekeeping that allowed me to publish it. But on the other hand, people, it was undercut by the fact that I was the author of a book called Housekeeping, you know? Sure. I mean, the, the a woman writer the writing woman writer. about her housekeeping. Yes, exactly. You, they had probably hadn't read it. <laughs> <laughs> in all probability. But, you know, people, uh, I, I think that probably the worst problem the world has is that people veer away from truly painful information. Mm -hmm. They'd much rather, I mean, in a certain way, I, I've met, said many times in Britain and here that, that uh, if, I had to ha if I could have written only one book in my life, it would have been Mother Country. But I've had to use my novels sort of as flotation devices <laughs> to keep it from just sinking out of sight because it's not what people want to know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, in 19, I hope I get this right, 89, Frank Conroy, contacted you about coming here to teach in the writer's workshop. What was your initial reaction when he wrote you or when they contacted you about coming to Iowa City, Iowa? I don't know where you were when you got the call. I was in Northampton, Massachusetts. Oh, you were in, okay. Um, I, I had been, um, my son was not um, happy in the school system in Massachusetts. And uh, I had put him in a little private school, which seemed to be sort of tottering toward extinction. <laughs> and so, um, actually, when, I, when it was suggested to me that I come here, the first thing I thought was that could solve this problem because I, I knew that Iowa City, or Iowa in general, um, had a good mm -hmm. public school system. Um, it took a lot of talk for me to convince my son to come here. Um, he had, you know, he had every prejudice against the Middle West that a high school sure. person is capable of. Um, but he came with me, and uh, his big brother came with us. He left college and came here and uh, to just sort of help his brother through the transition and everything. And uh, 
my older son is still here. Too. He just loves the place. He was like a fish to water. You know? mm -hmm. um, and, and my younger son liked it pretty well, too. But then it's a tough time to come, yeah. excuse me, to interrupt. It's yeah. a, at high school. Oh, absolutely. All the cliques are pretty solid. And uh, absolutely, yes. But, you know, he, it all worked out fine. Good. Um, you're, I've, been, I've read that your, your, your classes and the seminars are, are peop, the students just come in droves. Is there something that they want from you? What do you think they want from you as a, as a teacher slash writer? Um, is there, are there questions they continually ask you year after year, every new batch of writers, young writers? Oh, I don't. I, I, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say droves either. Oh. <laughs> I back off from the droves right. like a little bit. <laughs> but um, I don't, I mean, I think that they're very interested in um, how writers talk about literature. Um, I think that this is something that they appreciate simply from the whole setting, the whole faculty. Um, especially, I think, in the last 20 years or so, um, they, if they've studied literature, they have not studied it in the way that writers would read it or teach it, you know. Um, and so, in a way, we're often re-educating them to see texts in a different way than perhaps they have learned in university. Mm -hmm. um, basically, it's a sort of um, adult conversation among people that are interested in books, you know, and um, very, very pleasant. Do you... Do they want criticism from you? I mean, do they want uh, input about their writing? Or do they show you their writing? Well, not in seminar, but certainly in workshop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I look at what they write on a weekly basis and we talk about it. Um, in, in seminar, I try to, I usually teach sort of classical literature like 19th century American or Faulkner or, Melville, you know, um, because they are interested in literature that's perhaps less accessible to them, you know. Um, they like to be helped with that, in a sense, to have that conversation opened up. I, I don't teach contemporary literature because I think they're probably at least as good at reading that as I am, you know. So 19th century is your area that you... Usually. I also teach uh, Bibleist literature. Mm -hmm. How important is teaching to you? Well, I sort of made a little experiment. I, I got a grant that was supposed to uh, support me for five years on the condition that I stopped teaching. And after a year and a half, I resigned the grant and went back to teaching because I just felt like I'd been floated away on an iceberg, you know. I just, I, the, the idea that everything was going on and I had nothing to do with it. Not that I'm the most, you know, uh, gregarious person in the world, but um, that was... That was just too stark. I couldn't get anything done. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, your two latest books, Gilead and Home, both, like I said in the introduction, won these awards. And for viewers who are tuned into this program who have not read Gilead and Home, Sarah Churchill in The Guardian writes, both novels concern our failures to transcend our own lesser natures and the small transient moments of grace when we succeed, would you say she got, is that how you look at the two I, things? I, I think that's defensible. Defensible? <laughs> <laughs> it's also about love isn't earned. That's a, that's a huge theme. Yes. Love uh -huh. is not, and grace and forgiveness. And you have in the book Home, which is my, may I have to tell you it's my favorite, mm -hmm. is uh, about forgiveness and grace. Would you read that excerpt from that? Certainly. It's, it's beautiful. There is a saying that to understand is to forgive, but that is an error, so Papa used to say. You must forgive in order to understand. Until you forgive, you defend yourself against the possibility of understanding. If you forgive, he would say, you may indeed still not understand, but you will be ready to understand. And that is the posture of grace. Difficult, but... 
doable. <laughs> we hope. <laughs> we hope. Yes. Is it, is it hard to let go of your characters once the novel is? I would be hard pressed to let go of Jack. He was uh, my favorite character. Is is it hard? Well, you know, it was hard with housekeeping. I went through a fairly protracted period of mourning, you know. <laughs> um, and then, so that was what I expected. And so when I was done with Gilead, I was, you know, about midway through the process of mourning. And then I thought, what am, why am I doing this? If these characters still mean so much to me, give them their own book, you mm -hmm. know. And so I actually failed to give up on my characters after Gilead. <laughs> <laughs> there comes the crew back into, into home. Oh, that's such a wonderful novel. I, I loved it. Um, your, I, trying to get all these little areas of your, big areas of your life in this interview. Um, you, like I said in the introduction, uh, attend the Congregational Church in Iowa City and are often asked to preach. Do you, you, do you like to t give a, a sermon? Is that enjoyable? No, and oh. also I'm, I'm not often asked. Oh. That's like with oh droves. My. Oh, droves, oh dear. <laughs> From well, time to time. I'm, I'm being a little <laughs> excessive. <laughs> From time to time I have been uh -huh. asked to preach. And I, I, uh, it's an interesting thing to do. It's demanding. And I think I've learned a lot from it. I mean, it probably made it much easier for me to write about pastors, for example. Um, but I, it makes me nervous. And uh, whenever I give a sermon, I have written it in complete, absolute detail, every comma, every period, you know, I, there is no improvisation at all because it makes me very nervous, mm. and I have to, I have to have my crutch. Well, I, I didn't. You didn't seem nervous. I heard you a couple of weeks ago on Reformation Sunday. Mm -hmm. You didn't seem nervous, so well, you, I'm good at pretending at this point, you know. Oh, good. Um, I read in the research that you feel very fortunate to do what you do and have the solitary time to do it, even though we've been talking about all these other areas of your life of teaching and uh, interviews that you're asked time and time again to be interviewed. But you also feel a kind of an obligation that time is short um, and solitude is very comfortable for you. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about that, about um, being able to tune out the world and be able to focus. That's such a gift. Well, you know, frankly, it's almost alarmingly easy for me. Oh. <laughs> my, my, my biggest problem is tuning back in, I oh, think. Okay. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm always so sort of grateful when the class has gone without some major omission on my part, you know, because um, what I, I think that basically if I were to be diagnosed, and I intend to avoid that at all costs, okay. all right. I would be an obsessive personality. I, I, I become very close focused on whatever is most salient in my mind, and, and uh, I can forget, overlook everything. Amazing. That's incredible. Not many people can do that. I look at it as something positive, and well, that's how you mm, can create. Yeah. I think, I mean, I, certainly I, I owe everything to it at the same time that, I mean, while that's true, on the other hand, you have to live a human life, and you can seem very bumbling and inconsiderate and all the rest of it. <laughs> Just on the basis of being too narrowly focused on something that nobody else knows anything about. One of the uncanny things about writing fiction is that you are completely absorbed by people who don't exist. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> Well, then you must take a break from this and take your darling little dog, Otis, out for a walk. Does he kind of give you a nice break from when you're when you're writing he does he does fairly often more more typically he's a little little nub of guilt that i oh. <laughs> <laughs> because i'm yes exactly otis is one of the things that can be overlooked when i'm overlooking things and that's oh. i hate to say it but it's true but i've seen you walk the streets with reading a book and with <laughs> otis so <laughs> <laughs> You're multitasking that time. <laughs> Absolutely. I read that uh, Obama was asked, President Obama was asked, what are some of his favorite books on his list of, um, and Gilead. He put Gilead along with 
Lincoln's collective writings and the Bible. <laughs> that must have just made you feel pretty darn good. It made me feel very good. <laughs> it really did. It really did. Yeah. That was wonderful. I'm still waiting for him to, in some other way, acknowledge my existence. He's, he hasn't done that at all. Um, you know what I mean? I wouldn't mind a little pie, you know? <laughs> well, he is in China now. He is in China. He's a busy man. I, I, but I think he'll come back to Iowa because this is where he got his start. He definitely, he has to do that. I just, my heart just aches for that man. I mean, has anybody ever taken over authority at a more besieged moment? You are right. It is, this is a profoundly difficult time for him. Oh. I wish I think about him often and wish him well. Yes, exactly. I mean, trying to trying to patch together solutions to problems nobody's ever seen before. Mm -hmm. And if the solution is sixty percent successful, people only notice the forty percent. You know, know. it's know. just unbelievable. But he seems to have a good spirit. In he his. does. I'm glad he's young. I am glad he's I am too. I am too. <laughs> Speaking of young, you are a grandmother of a little girl, and you have a new zip code. Is yes. that correct? A new zip code. Uh, well, don't you? Did you get an apartment? Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I, I actually have an apartment upstairs from my son's apartment in What does in he Queens. do, your son? Um, well, he teaches... Um, he tends to do sort of specialist teaching of kids at a high school level. Um, and what he's doing is teaching um, children with cancer in Sloan Kettering Hospital in New York, mm. um, which is, you know, I mean, he has to try to sort of sustain them so that um, if they can return to, to whatever school setting they were in before, they will not have lost too many, you know, steps. So um, he's continuously sort of, you know, what should I say? Well, preparing mm -hmm. for the specific needs of these kids, you know, who are often dealing with really, really difficult mm. circumstances. So. And he's the father of your granddaughter. Yes, he is. Mm -hmm. Who's, um, and then your son, you have a son in Iowa City. Yes. Mm -hmm. And your mother is living still in Idaho? No, she lives in Charlottesville. She oh, lives she... near my, my brother. Okay. And what does she think about all of your accolades and successes. Well, you know... You talk to her, I know, frequently. Yeah. Oh, yes, we talk several times a week at a, at a minimum. You, you know? brought in a beautiful photo of her. Oh, she's yes. just <laughs> stunning. Yeah. She, she's a lovely lady. But, um, you know, she is a... There's something of... Accolades, maybe it's Idaho. You know what I mean? It's like accolades just aren't that big a deal, you know? Um... She's, you know, she's glad I'm doing mm -hmm. well. And but, glad you're teaching. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm. What are your, what books are by, are to read in your to read stack? Um, what are you, oh, what's have, drawing you right now? Oh, my goodness. You know, I have a, a specialist's interest. You may have come across this in John Calvin. And this is the 500th anniversary year of his birth which means that there's been a huge surge of books about him and by him also in, in print, in translation and so on. And I buy them all. And they're sitting in stacks around my house. <laughs> Talking, <laughs> read me, read, read me. me. Yes, yeah, exactly. And you're trying so, to find time. <laughs> right, exactly. I look at them and think of that other life I'm not living, you know. But um, I'll get to them. I'll get to them. There, a couple weeks ago, the Wall Street Journal had a uh, big page and interviewed different writers from Margaret Atwood to Andace about where do they write or what do they write on. May I, where do you write? Where do you write when, you, when the emerging voice comes to you? Well, um, I have a study in my house in Iowa City. I have a, a study in... in uh, I, <laughs> I'm kind of embarrassed to say, but I actually have a house in upstate New York. Um, which has a study um, that I, where I wrote home almost entirely. You spent how many months there, in and out? Normally I spend the summer there, and then I also um, spend long vacations there. Not always, but usually. Do you write on, in longhand, or do you write on a computer? Fiction I normally write longhand, um, nonfiction on a computer. 
But I switch back and forth. If I'm feeling blocked writing longhand, I try computer for a while mm -hmm. and so on. And it's nice. I don't know why it makes a change in you know, this my state of mind, but it mm -hmm. does. Our time has run out, but my last question is, uh, what are some of the things, you don't have to have a long list, uh, about why you like to live in Iowa? What's the best part of living in Iowa City for you? Well, it has, I think, it has a very unique cultural life. It really does. And and the the slant of the cultural life here toward writing is something that makes it especially <laughs> congenial to me. Um, I like the fact, I mean, I love the fact that my students love it here. Um, a lot of them stay around, you know, and, and uh, find it, they find it supportive. It helps them write. And um, I like the history of the place. I like, you know, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a sweet little town. <laughs> well, we're glad you're here. And, well, thank and you. And thank you for taking the time. I know how busy you are and appreciate it. Oh, thank you. My guest on One of a Kind has been the award-winning novelist, essayist, teacher, mother, grandmother, and occasional preacher, Marilyn <laughs> Robinson. <laughs> Words used to describe my guest are formidable intellect, curious, serious Christian, wry sense of humor, insightful, respectful of other opinions, self-sufficient, and kind. Marilyn Robinson is one of a kind.